All right, welcome back everybody. This is David Panush of the Edmund Burke School. Uh, I'm gonna do a video lecture, still talking about evolutionary psychology. In previous lectures, we talked about how evolutionary psychology helps explain human behavior in general. We talked about how evolution works and how that has led to the psychology that humans have, what we're calling the knobs of human nature. This time we're gonna talk about two things. We're gonna talk about, this is kind of a follow on on the, the ancestral environment in which we evolved, which was around for hundreds of thousands of years, um, versus the kind of world we live in today. So how evolutionary psychology in the modern world works or feels and what it leads to. And then we're gonna finish with the evidence for evolutionary psychology, not what it is, but how does one know whether or not evolutionary psychology is a, a viable explanation supported by evidence for why humans behave the way that they behave. First, let's talk about evolutionary psychology in the modern world. Roughly 10,000 years ago, Homo sapiens transitioned from a nomadic hunter-gatherer lifestyle to a settled agricultural lifestyle. And this happened in various places throughout the world, roughly around the same time, more or less. In some places it didn't happen, which is why we still have hunter-gatherer cultures even today, but it happened in enough places that it led to a real big change in the way that humans live and interact with one another. And 10,000 years is a long time. It's not nothing, even in evolutionary time, but it's not a lot compared to the 300 or 200,000 years that we lived as hunter-gatherers in nomadic small tribes, uh, mostly uh, you know, starting out in, in various parts of Africa. So it starts with agriculture. That leads to settlements. It leads to bigger groups of people that become larger and more complex over time. And if you can look at over that 10,000-year history, you have to today of ever more complex, ever larger societies of numbers of people, right? We're no longer interacting with small, closely related groups of kin, more or less, and we're no longer um, hunter-gatherers, we're no longer nomadic, we're, we're seeing strangers all the time, we meet thousands of people in our lifetime. Um, you know, we travel all over the world. So many things are different than the way that we evolved to live, which means that our evolved psychology and our evolved biology was optimized for an environment that is really different than the one we live in. And what that results in is what is called a mismatch, okay? There's a mismatch between the way we evolved, what worked in the past, between what we have to deal with now. And so from a non-psychology standpoint, the, you know, the easiest example is our, our yearning for sugar, right? So that is a really good evolutionary adaptation for living the way we lived for hundreds of thousands of years, or even previous to that, other species as well, because it keeps you searching for the fruit or the high calorie, high value food that's going to let you survive and reproduce. Today, we walk around all day surrounded by tons of sugar, and many of us are obese because we can't just turn it off. You can't turn off the evolutionary drive for sweet things. I mean, obviously, some of us, there's a distribution. Some people are more prone to eating sugar than others, but all of us, to some degree, want it and crave it and need it. Same thing with other things. So it's not as a mismatch between what we evolved and what we have now. Another example is the constant notifications that we get in our technological world today. In the evolutionary environment, or the ancestral environment, novelty, new stimuli, had to be paid attention to because what happens if that new stimuli is a threat or an opportunity? We need to focus on it and figure it out immediately because otherwise we could get eaten or we could miss an opportunity to, you know, to succeed in some way. Today, we get the ding, we get the this, we get the that, it's, it's, and our brains say, pay attention to that, it's new but most of the time we shouldn't or don't need to. So there's a mismatch between what we're evolved to do and what we, the society we currently exist in. We're gonna see more of these mismatches and you'll look at them. In terms of evidence for evolutionary psychology, how can we, with a theory that says, I'm gonna help you explain human behavior, actually know that this theory is a good one? And any theory that we have to explain anything, we need to come up with evidence. We need to gather evidence, and the evidence may confirm the theory or contradict the theory, and, and it may be mixed, and that doesn't mean we throw it out. It may mean we have to look closer, right? So um, 
one thing we can do is say, is what we are seeing, whatever behavior or emotion that we're seeing humans take, do we see it in most of the time typical, all humans, all places, when you look closely enough? And if you do, then that's evidence that it has some kind of evolutionary or biological basis that precedes the culture that we're in right now. All right, does the theory help you predict? So if I make a prediction based off of what I think I know about human evolution and the way our psychology works, can it help me predict how people will actually behave in the real world? And then I can test that prediction out. And if the theory helps make accurate predictions, then that means it it's, supports the theory, right? Finally, and maybe perhaps most importantly, what are the sources of data um, that we can gather? that will either show, yes, this is something that helps us, or no, it contradicts. So first, think about historical records, and that's gonna be uh, anthropology, sociology, archeology, span all can provide data that might support or contradict the theory. When we see people uh, in the historical record behaving a certain way, can we explain it or not? Um, and then animals. We wanna look at animals because even though our direct um, evolutionary ancestors uh, went extinct, we have close relatives in the animal world. So our closest, um, I mean, if we see them doing something, if we see apes acting a certain way, then it, it would suggest that we, in our shared common ancestor, might have also had that trait. Although it could have been that both species developed it afterwards, but still it, it's, it's suggestive. And in terms of the great apes, just kind of good to have these four in your pocket who are the most closely related great apes? Um, all primates are related to us, but the great apes are most closely related to us. Chimps and bonobos are most closely related to us, sharing over 99% of our DNA. Um, bonobos, I think, technically are a type of chimp. I may have that wrong, but they are very closely related to each other as well, obviously. And if you've never heard of bonobos, it's time to, time to learn about bonobos because they're quite different than chimps. And by looking at chimps and bonobos, I think it gives us kind of different stories of how humans may or may not have evolved in certain ways. And then the other two big ones are gorillas and orangutans. But those are the four. Gibbons are also pretty closely related to us, but um, they're not one of the great apes. Um, and monkeys are interesting, of course, as well. But any animal could give us insight. Because if you go back far enough, all the same. And the other big thing we want to do to prove our theory or dis or contradict it is look at experiments. And there are two kinds of experiments. One is the kind of experiment you're thinking of, which is like a clinical experiment, right? So it's in a lab, you know, right? There are people, people who conduct these things. Subjects have to come into the lab. I can control for the variables, exactly what I want to test. Um, you know, people in this room get this thing, people in this room get this other thing. One is a control, which means nothing maybe is changing. And the other one, I change some variables and I can measure the different conditions against each other and find out if there are statistically significant differences and then make a conclusion based on that. Now, the problem with that, the good thing about it is I control everything as much as I can. The bad thing about it is that it's hard to generalize because what if the people I bring in are only white or only educated or only, um, you know, whatever. They're not as representative as I might want them to be. That's one problem. The second problem is that it's not the real world. It's a lab situation and people don't behave the same way, may not behave the same way in a lab as they might in the real world. So we might not be able to generalize to other people or other situations or contexts. So the second way we might gather data is through what are called natural experiments. Now these could be manipulated by scientists, um, but in real world settings, so the context is more, more natural, or there's some sort of natural lucky happenstance where two um, towns, you know, both near each other, both demographically similar, enact different policies, right? And then we can see, well, one enacted this policy and it had this effect, and we can kind of make some inferences um, you know, there's some difference between them that allows us to, from observation. Now, the good thing about that is it's more natural. It may allow us to generalize more, but we have a lot less control of the variables because there could be lots of different explanations for what we're seeing. So what scientists sometimes try and do is they do both. Psychologists, you know, they try and do sort of real world natural experiments, 
and they test it in a way like let's look at real world examples and they pay, bring people into the lab. One of the thing, ways they've gotten better in terms of bringing people into the lab is that they do try and go you know, around the world and repeat the experiments with different people in different cultures and different age groups and different blah, 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 blah. And that does give it a lot more power. Um, but it is important when you read about any study in psychology to be not to be not skeptical, but critical, to be thoughtful. Who did they do this study on? Did they repeat the study? Did they repeat it in other parts of the world, et cetera, et cetera, to understand just how much can we take away from that study to generalize to other people and other human beings. All right, so those are the two big ideas um, here. Evidence for evolutionary psychology and understanding the mismatch between evolutionary psychology evolved hundreds of thousands of years ago versus today and where those things don't match up. All right, as usual, if you have questions, let me know.